Hi, I'm Jonathan Burke, Professor of Finance at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And I'm Jules van Binsbergen, a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most surprising studies of the last few years in finance. Before we get there, let's just give some background. So let's start with the fact that there's been a large growth in the number of people managing money in mutual funds, index funds, and things like that. So if we look at post-war data, then in 1946, the vast majority of corporate equities in the United States were held by households, not by institutional investors. But 75 years later, we see that the majority of corporate equities in the United States are held by institutional investors, such as mutual funds, ETFs, pension plans, and so forth. So what's basically happened is the role of intermediaries has come very large. When previously, 70 years ago, each individual invested directly in the stock market. Today, most people invest in the stock market indirectly, either through their pension plans, or maybe they have mutual funds, or through various intermediaries. And this has been a trend. And most people would say this trend has been really good. In particular, there's been a huge growth in index funds, funds that just buy all the stocks in the world. And that's most people think is a very good thing because it's allowed people to hold diversified portfolios at very low cost. So if you think about that period just after the Second World War, if you wanted to hold a diversified portfolio as an individual investor, it was really difficult because you have to go out there and buy each of the stocks on your own. There are tons of transaction costs associated with all that trading. But today, Jonathan, I think holding a diversified portfolio is essentially free. Large index fund providers give investors the opportunity to hold large diversified portfolios for very low fees. And just think about the welfare benefit of that. On a previous show, we spoke about the fact that everybody wants to diversify. There is never a good reason to hold non-diversifiable risk. And so making that cheap means that everybody gets to participate. And so most people would regard that as one of the great advances in intermediation in the last 50 years. But that trend of having more intermediation has also come with concentration in that intermediation sector. And what we mean with that is that there is a small group of very large asset management firms, and they together control, therefore, a large fraction of this total market of both bonds and stocks. So to just give you some numbers, BlackRock is a firm that currently manages $10 trillion. And if you compare that to the total size of the world stock markets, which is about $100 trillion, and then add to that at least another $100 trillion for the world bond market, you see that BlackRock probably owns about 5% of all securities in the world. Meaning that on average, in any company, BlackRock has a 5% stake. And for many companies, it means BlackRock is the largest shareholder. And if we add Vanguard to that, Vanguard's $8 trillion. So Vanguard has a 4% stake on average in every single company. And so what this means is that these large money managers are the very large shareholders in most companies. Indeed. And so the main topic of today's podcast episode is whether that so-called concentrated ownership has consequences, not just in financial markets, but potentially also in product markets. This is the surprising study. So three finance professors, Jose Azar, Martin Schmaltz, and Isabel Taku, did a study in the airline industry. And so before we can tell you the results of the study, we should just briefly explain how the airline industry works. Airlines have a lot of different routes, and these individual routes get individual pricing. So the airline decides for every route between any two cities what a good ticket price is. Now, the price that they set for every route, of course, is going to depend on the amount of competition that they face on that route. So if 12 different airlines all offer flights between two particular cities, that will provide much more competition on that route compared to a route where you are the only airline who flies there. Right. So now let's think about how the ownership of the intermediaries of Vanguard and say BlackRock, how that will interact with routes. So let me give you an example. 
So imagine that Vanguard and BlackRock both own Delta Airlines and United Airlines, but do not own American. Okay, just imagine for argument's sake. I'm not saying that's true, but this is just for argument's sake. Now, there are some cases where Delta and United will be competitors on a route, and in some cases where they won't be competitors on a route. So imagine the following. So Vanguard and BlackRock both own Delta and United. So we look at all the routes where Delta and United are servicing, and we will say, well, that routes have high common ownership because both these large money managers own both Delta and United, but they don't own America. So we look at another route where American and Delta are competing. Well, in that case, they're not going to have a lot of common ownership because for argument's sake, we assumed that Vanguard and BlackRock didn't own America. And so the American and Delta route would be a case of less common ownership. Now, using this measure of common ownership, the authors show that there's an association between common ownership and ticket prices, meaning if the common ownership is higher, it seems that the airline are charging higher prices on those routes. Now, it's important. This is just a correlation. It's not obvious that it's because of the common ownership that they are charging higher ticket prices. But the interesting economic question is, could it be that the common ownership is causing the airlines to compete less. That's what our basic antitrust laws are. The reason we have antitrust laws is we don't want companies to dominate markets. And so the, these authors were worried or thinking, is it possible that the reason those ticket prices were higher had to do with the fact that on the route, the same people owned both airlines. And obviously, in that case, if you own both airlines, you don't want them to compete. And as we've discussed on several previous episodes, what we need to establish whether or not there is a causal effect here is that we need to have a certain amount of randomness that allows us to run an experiment. And in this particular case, the authors came up with the following experiment, the following change that allowed them to study this causal question. And the change that they looked at was the merger of BlackRock and iShares, the merger between two asset managers. Now, as you can imagine, because of this merger, the common ownership measures suddenly changed. And so it's very hard to imagine that the pricing of airline routes could have a reverse causality, a causality onto this merger decision. So if we assume that the merger decision and the airline prices had nothing to do with each other, then this sudden change and this merger between BlackRock and iShares could give us a nice experiment to see what common ownership does to airline prices. So just to be clear about this, the working hypothesis is as follows, that the merger of iShares and BlackRock had absolutely nothing to do with airlines, but it did change the common ownership. And so the question is, how did that random change in the common ownership affect prices on those routes. And so what the authors found was that one year after the merger, route prices increased on the routes that had higher common ownership. And so that seems to be evidence that the common ownership does seem to matter for the competitive landscape in the airline industry. I think there's no question most economists would agree that the natural experiment that these authors figured out was very, very clever. But by the same token, most economists found the result, I would say, enormously surprising. BlackRock and Vanguard say they only own at best 5 10% of a company. How could owning that small share of a company, I mean, it's not small compared to other shareholders, but in the aggregate, 10% is not 50%. How could that have affected the management to choose which routes to compare on as a function of who owns their stock? Now, we could, of course, think about direct mechanisms. But to tell you the truth, Jonathan, the hypothesis that there are direct calls where there is a coordination between the airlines where they say, hey, on this route, we have more or less competition with these other airlines that have common owners. And therefore, we're going to explicitly set the prices differently. That seems a hard one to swallow for me. What do you think? I agree with you, Jules. It seems very hard to swallow. However, the experiment 
that these authors ran is a very clever experiment. And you are left saying, well, wait a minute. Why else would those ticket prices have increased? And I think what makes this paper so interesting is, let's say it were the case that what the authors have found really is the case. Well, that raises enormous concerns because all of a sudden, what seems like a fantastic innovation, almost free diversification services, everybody could take it with no downside. All of a sudden, there's a possible downside that by having these very large intermediaries providing these very low cost services, there's a downside in terms of product competition that consumers are worse off. So I think that concern is pretty large. And so combine that with the fact that the experiment is very well designed, left a lot of people thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe we should be thinking more seriously about these issues. And then just to be clear, Jonathan, though, it is not necessarily the case that the fact that people have diversified portfolios cause this problem, right? There are a bunch of different channels that we need to think about. Maybe if we just don't have such a concentrated industry in the asset management side, that would already solve the problem. So it's not that we would necessarily have to give up diversification services in the context of this question. It may just be that the concentration in the asset management industry is too large. Well, Jules, yes and no. Part of the reason I think diversification services are so cheap is the enormous economies of scale that these large managers have. And if we were to say, well, you can't run them in the size that they're running them, it's not clear that we would get the very cheap diversification services. Now, again, that would be a trade-off. But the question is, is there a downside here? So with that in mind, let me introduce Professor Martin Smiles, who's Professor of Finance and Economics at Oxford University. He heads the Finance, Economics, and Management area at the Said School of Business at Oxford University, and he's one of the authors of the study we're talking about. Martin, welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's great to have you, Martin. So, Martin, how big is this problem? I think the problem is probably very big. So it is probably very big in the U.S. And how big it is elsewhere and in private markets, um, that we don't know yet. But in U.S. public markets, it's very big. And so give us some sense of the uh, magnitude. All right. So look, Vanguard as a fund family by now controls more than 10% of the average U.S. publicly traded firm's stock. That's in the S&P 500, okay, so the large company stock. Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street combined control about a quarter. And you can't really be that big without being influential. Now, my impression is that they don't use that control in the same way as an alternative active investor would. And I think that poses some problems to corporate governance. But I want to already forestall a perhaps end you focus on the index funds or the so-called index funds. Of course, they're not funds, they're fund families. Because there's also active investors and activists that just buy shares and competitors and use them without much scrutiny. So, for example, Bill Gates' family office holds a third of one waste management company. And then together with the Gates Foundation holds 8-9% of another waste management company. So it's not very hard to see how when you hold a third of a publicly traded company, you might have some influence on them. No? So if you have influence in one firm and hold lots of financial interest in a rival, that this would reduce incentives to compete, that seems pretty obvious. And that's not an isolated case. Activists like Pershing Square hold Domino's Pizza, Burger King, and what was the last one? Chipotle's or so. Or there's a hedge fund called Value Act that buys huge stakes in Baker Hughes and Halliburton oil exploration companies without telling the Department of Justice and FTC about it. And they got in trouble for that. So it happens not just that so-called index funds hold shares and competitors, but it happens sometimes at a larger scale that active and activist shareholders um, also just buy up shares and competitors. But Martin, I thought that that was something the FTC and the antitrust people watch out for. But don't they watch out for people that buy shares in competing firms? Well, they're supposed to. In order to be able to do that, these shareholders would have to file forms with the antitrust authorities. For example, they have to send Hart Scott Rodino Act HSR forms. But if they don't, then how is it supposed to monitor that? And as a matter of due course, the antitrust authorities don't monitor ownership of the firms at all. 
right? So the only ownership information we have comes from the securities regulator, whose job is to protect investors. The antitrust authorities, not just in the US, but also elsewhere, usually just assume that if two firms have two different names, then they must be owned by different investors. But, you know, that is just not corresponding to the facts. So in short, no, they don't collect data on that and they don't watch out for that phenomenon. So, okay, I mean, this is something that I didn't even realize. I mean, my biggest concern is just the concern of people, of these large funds having joint ownership by virtue of the fact that they're just indexing, that they're trying to diversify and they're holding, you know, all the companies in the world. And that because they're so large, that gives them very large stakes in comparative companies. And that influences, apparently, according to your work, that influences corporate strategy. Yep. So I think that is partially true. But let me tell you two ways in which that view is incomplete. And I just recently figured this out in joint work with a colleague at Oxford, Amir Amelzadeh, and a student, Fiona Kaspert. So the two ways in which that is incomplete is, for one, that it's not just the so-called indexers that drive common ownership, but it's also the activists, as I just gave in two examples, but that's also true, you know, statistically speaking. Those are not isolated examples. But the other way in which it's not true is what I previously mentioned. It's not like a single fund owns 10% of an issuer. It is all the many funds within the fund family that jointly control 10% of an issuer, right? The problem with that is hence more so that there's centralized corporate control. There's a centralization of corporate control within the fund family, as opposed to that the index fund, you know, the level at which the indexing happens would be driving common ownership. So those are the two ways in which I think that view is incomplete, that indexing just mechanically drives common ownership. I mean, that's clear in theory, but in practice, it doesn't seem to be the only driver. And I'm not sure it's the, the, the main driver. I think where people have the biggest problem with your work is they just don't see the mechanism. I mean, they're not going to board meetings and telling them not to compete, right? So I think we're pretty certain of that. So what are they actually doing? How are they getting this done? So indeed, it's a frequent question we received. It's such a frequent question that we just published a JPE paper to answer it. So look, I am going to give you a bit of a long answer. The first one is a theoretical point that says all you need for these results to be there is standard principal agent theory. You need lazy shareholders and lazy managers, and that's going to implement all the results. And I'll walk you through the mechanic of that. Okay. Basically, the answer is not doing anything. If they don't do anything, that's a sufficient mechanism by contrast to an active owner who would do something, right? So nobody doubts that Richard Branson behaves very differently as an owner or Elon Musk behaves very differently as an owner than Vanguard does, right? And this is everything you need. But I'll, I'll get, go back to that in a moment. But if I get too deep into that and too excited about it, then I'm going to forget to say there's also plenty of active interventions by common owners. My Twitter account is full of episodes from reading the newspaper where common owners call up competitors and tell them to reduce output and meet in a Manhattan high rise to think about how they're going to change executive pay to discourage producing more output. I mean, that happens just explicitly as well. Now, with that real world observation in place, let's go back to theory. So what's the point here? Well, the manager goes to the board and says, I would like high and not variable pay. You know, we have increasing and concave utility. That doesn't seem very controversial. The question is just how does a board respond? And if the board works for some lazy type of asset manager that doesn't really care, they'll say, yes, that seems fine. And if the manager meets Elon Musk on that board or Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos or so, then that more stronger board might say, no, uh, those shells have variable pay and not more pay than your outside option. No? So, and such it is that managers in companies controlled by common owners tend to have less performance sensitive pay. Okay, that's a fact. Companies controlled by common owners give their managers less performance sensitive pay. So what would a standard principal agent model say about what will happen in these firms? Well, they work less hard. They don't cut costs quite as aggressively. And then, well, then the firm's cost is high. And what happens in the industry if you look with the firm has high costs, it sets high prices. And that's it. Wait, I just gave you a theory of why common ownership leads to higher prices. The firms have high costs and the managers don't cut costs because they're not being monitored very aggressively. That's it. Basically, the manager gets a contract that says, live the good life. Live the good life means don't work very hard, 
which means don't compete very hard. And so the companies effectively get this done without explicitly saying don't compete. That's exactly right. But let's just paraphrase this and say, if you want a company to go, fight super hard with a union, cut wages, start a price war with a rival, you actually have to do something to make that palatable to the manager. I mean, at least you'd have to give the guy some variable pay or the person who runs the corporation. And they don't do that. That's it. They just don't push them. It's a quiet life story. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. But that said, it doesn't really apply to your original airlines paper because there the airlines are picking and choosing amongst routes. It seems like in that case, they're actually working pretty hard. It seems like that, but it doesn't. But let me convince you that this mechanism we just discussed, which is very boring, actually explains root level correlations between common ownership and higher prices. Look, so there are three airlines in the country. It's the aforementioned Delta and United. And then there is a Virgin America, you know, the Richard Branson owned one. And Richard Branson doesn't call up the CEO every week and tells that person to cut costs and buy more airplanes and open new routes and I don't know what. Okay, so Virgin America turned out to be a low-cost carrier by virtue of the owner making it a low-cost carrier. And Delta and United are not. They just have the quiet life and have high costs. Okay, what's going to happen in routes where Delta and United compete? Well, they have high costs, so they set high prices. And in routes where Virgin America competes with Delta, Virgin America lets, has low costs, so it's going to set low prices. Wait, and there's no common ownership between Virgin America and Delta? And that's the route where there are low prices. And there's high common ownership between Delta and United, and that's where the high prices are. Oh, look, I just gave you a model in which you get a root level correlation between common ownership and higher prices mm -hmm. without there being any sort of collusion whatsoever. Nobody actually even thinks about root level decisions, much less the CEO. Actually, the guy or computer who does the root level prices just takes a firm's cost as given. That comes from not having fought hard with the union or whatever it is. Takes a cost as given, sets prices so as to maximize the firm's profit. Completely traditional IO model. The CEO never thinks about root level prices. The CEO just thinks about whether to fight hard with the union or not. But that determines whether the costs of the firm are high. So nobody actually thinks about root level prices. It is as if by an invisible hand that when you take the incentives to compete away, you will get a correlation between common ownership and higher prices. Although nobody thinks about it. Nobody works very hard at all in that model. And again, that is just a theoretical benchmark to say, no, actually, you know, people believe that, that somebody must be sitting there thinking about how to price a particular route based on the ownership of the firm and the competitors. That's not what you need at all. The only thing you need is a lazy shareholder combined with a lazy manager. That's all you need. So this is really not an antitrust concern then? Wait a sec. So people, okay, I think you're taking a shortcut. You think that the antitrust is about preventing collusion. Well, that's true. There's a thing called Sherman Act Section 1. And if you fix prices, that means that you go to jail and that's bad. But there's also the Clayton Act. And Clayton Act Section 7 says, I paraphrase, you're not allowed to buy an asset if the effects of that asset acquisition was to lessen competition, period. doesn't say anything about collusion or the mechanism by which this is being brought about. So if you take that literally, you would say, well, a common owner at some point acquired the asset and the result of the asset acquisition was to lessen competition. Prices are higher as a result of the asset acquisition. That's illegal. That's it. So it is very much an antitrust issue. It is just not about collusion. If you, if you have an asset acquisition that lessens competition, you don't need collusion. I mean, otherwise, there would be no problem with mergers, right? Post-merger, the managers of the original firms don't collude anymore. You don't need to collude anymore once you have common ownership between the firms, right? So that's why it is very much an antitrust issue, although it's not about collusion. Indeed. So Martin, I want to talk a little bit about time trends. So clearly, index ownership is a time trend that we've seen that gone up in recent times. But there are a bunch of other time trends that potentially go in other directions. So, for example, we had people talk about CEO compensation and the life of CEOs. And I think their people would say that the quiet life hypothesis is much less relevant today than it used to be. And that if it, well, there was a time when the quiet life hypothesis should be applied, it should be in earlier times rather than now. Is your impression that the quiet life hypothesis applies more to these decades as it did in the past? That's one. And two... We had a whole episode also on unions, and it does seem that union membership and union influence is another thing that's really gone down rather than up. 
right? So there isn't much to compete with the unions on or to negotiate with the unions on. Let's move from the cross-section to the time series. What are your insights on the trends? Do we really see that the trends go in the same direction that you say? So on the quiet life, I'm trying to be uh, careful about impressions and rather look at facts. The fact is that wealth performance sensitivities of CEOs have gone down over the last two decades. Their pay levels have gone up, but the performance sensitivity as measured by wealth performance sensitivities have gone down. So that's very much in line with that time trend. More index ownership does correlate with lessened performance sensitivity of top management pay. Martin, that was really interesting. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was great to have you, Martin. Wonderful. Well, Jules, I have to say, I'm somewhat surprised about some of the things Martin said. I don't think I could have anticipated certainly his view on common ownership and the fact that shareholders don't manage the firm. No, I agree. I mean, that is a different perspective on the issue than we thought. Certainly, we already thought before that the direct mechanism seemed to be an unlikely mechanism, right? Where people would directly try to intervene and try to get the price setting to be different at the firm level. So it had to be some other mechanism. But the question is, Jonathan, I'm not quite sure how much this really has to do with large shareholders or common ownership at these institutional investor levels. Yeah, I agree, Jules. That also I was a bit surprised at because much of what he spoke about is just shareholders not voicing their opinion and not voting. And that could be occur with diverse shareholders all owning a very small fraction of the firm. So I, like you, am you know, a little bit confused about what that has to do with common ownership. But I do think that in the end, we can conclude that that's the empirical fact that there seems to be this correlation between common ownership and the pricing of those airline tickets remains a very interesting issue. Although I think that the mechanism through which it exactly operates still, I think, is in somewhat of an open question as far as I'm concerned. I agree. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcast. We'd love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcast. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by University FM.